thanks so much for for taking some time to chat with me. For anyone who maybe hasn't met you before, could you share a little bit about like who you are, what you're doing, and and give us the rundown on on everything Codino? Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. So where to begin there? Yes. Um, you used to be a pen tester and did a lot of stuff on GitHub, which was the main way I used to interact with community. Was um, my way I used to like in, interacting with the community. Um, and I was bug hunting on the side, got to the top 20 on bug crowd. So I was pretty reasonably successful as a bug hunter. Um, and I was chatting to the bug crowd team quite a lot at that point, just got to know different people in the team and different things and, uh, ended up breaking bad and leaving the pen test world to come and run security operations at uh, bug crowd. So I run, uh, pen testing, triage, a few other things I can't talk about yet, but, um, number of different product lines in there get to work with you know hack luke and vortex and sector and evil damon and heap of really amazing people so it's quite fun yeah yeah that's really cool yeah. when when you were in your pen test days were you doing a lot of like web application type security yeah yeah <laughs> yeah so i was fully remote i've been fully remote either part of full time since 2003 oh wow um, so you're so used I, to being I, at home <laughs> yeah, not a pen tester. I, used, I actually used to play poker for a living for seven years of that. Awesome. Um, so I kind of started from home from then and wanted to retain that. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I was I was fully remote for NCC Group, and the state I was in, there was only two of us. So got to do a lot of technical pre-sales, build up some business chops that way. I did an MBA as well, so that helps. Um, but um, most of my time there was large-scale externals because that's what a lot of code I write specializes in what I enjoy about bug bounties and um, I would do occasional source code reviews and internals and other things but predominantly web apps just because that's where my my principal strength lies so awesome yeah since since making the transition into to working at bug crowd now do you really get to do much of that technical (laughs) nitty-gritty stuff or are you more of like a people manager type role it's varied it's a team team of roughly 50 so it's oh i won't give exact numbers but it's around the 50 marks it's a big team that i've got um and i guess so that obviously keeps me in strategy a lot um because i've got um different managers under that and then i do get technical in terms of i've been doing youtube to keep myself technical or at least try and convince myself i'm still technical (laughs) i definitely you know i definitely see like uh, like a like Ryan I to write something up or you know watching Ben streams I'm like oh I'm missing I'm missing some chops these days I need to I need to dive in again um, and I do get to jump into appeals so when people appeal I often jump onto a lot of those on Twitter and whatnot um, as well as we do QA so I'm in, on the QA team as well so we have um, a lot of our more senior technical people in the QA process so at the end of each week we sample portion of each ASE's queue to make sure each ASE is doing a job and find opportunities for us to improve as a team or it helps us catch things where um, you know new vulnerability comes out and we may not be consistent in our triage effort we catch it in QA so everyone can be aligned um, it, uh, I just don't want that to be seen as oh triage is bad because it tends to be where some people take those kind of things which is <laughs> quite frustrating no it's, you know. it's a very necessary piece to it for sure um, mm. You know, but the bug the bug bounty scene is is definitely something that I, I personally haven't been able to dabble much in, uh, and it's mm. something I'm definitely looking to break more into. And obviously, you've got people like Naham Sekben and and Stoke and the big yeah. names, you, yourself included, that are you know really showing kind of the the spotlight of like what it's like to be a bug bounty hunter and, and how anyone <laughs> yeah. can do it. And you guys are producing content that that's really helpful for that. And you know what what kind of caused you or inspired you to start because you've been doing content in a way even before youtube like you were doing a lot of open source projects on github mm-hmm. which in a way is content right like you know what kind of kept you inspired to yeah. to make those type of projects and keep keep putting stuff out there i think it i mean for me part of it is um there was all these cool tools coming out and I didn't have the same reason to dig into it as I used to. And I wanted to like F Fuff was a good example. I knew it was awesome, but I never had time to really dive into it. So the first one I did, um, I, I basically studied, I went over the source for it. So you'll see in the write up, there's some things I raised, um, as I was writing it, I found some bugs and I was able to raise some bugs, which was nice. 
Um, but I basically did a source code review. I wrote the guide and I was originally just going to publish the guide. And then I was watching other people's content. I was like, oh, I should do a video. To, for me, it was, well, the, the landscape's changed. I know like Live Overflow's done it for years and Stoke had set a really high bar. Um, yeah. But then there was all these, there's these new creators coming out that were showing another way that community would follow. So like inside a PhD, yeah. Farah, like that all inspired me to go, okay, well, I want to, jump into that i think it's going to be a good wave of content for the community i always thought youtube you'd never get away with that it um because because stoke was covering hacking in a clever way that he was summarizing like the changing landscape and um live overflow was doing like deep level binary stuff and things that impact on uh company target less specific not to say you can't do that He's an amazing hacker but i always saw that as them finding a way that youtube wouldn't ban them um and then I guess other people proved that I, proved to me I was wrong. And um, so I took a shot at, okay, well, what happens if I make a hacking guide? Am I going to get the great old band hammer? Um, <laughs> I've dealt with that these myself. Days, yeah, these days I don't feel too too challenged. But I think if it's ethical hacking content, you've taken the right stance. Like Gwynevel, um, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, but um, he does really amazing streams. And um, he's in the content scene as well and works for Google. So yeah. he's helped clear up a lot for people because you know we do fall awry yeah there you go yeah yeah and i mean we do fall awry of the algorithm purely because there's more negative than positive content out there for the subject matter Um, when i say negative i mean there's more like this is how you pop a shell kind of content versus this is how you understand how to pop a shell right um and so i can understand the algorithm kind of going harsh on it (laughs) but it's good to know there's a path to resolution and i've started to up my my release schedule more because of that. I feel more confident in it now. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's an argument that I kind of have, have been having with a handful of people. It's like, you know, getting mad and getting upset at YouTube for, for taking down creators content, especially if it's for cybersecurity and trying to educate people, Mm. you know, but I feel like as long as there's a good way, you know, to, to actually get those issues resolved when they get it wrong, exactly. Then, then I feel like it's totally fine because, they do have a need to keep the platform safe and and there definitely are ways where the platform could be abused negatively yeah. to to uh. spread you know the the bad side of hacking or kind of well, it's a business too and i think that yeah. it's it's not practical for them to have someone review every video manually they have to find an automated approach and in that process there's going to be mistakes as there is with any automated system um anything at scale you get mistakes i mean triage is a good example we're now at the point where we have tens of thousands of submissions across all platforms right every single day well maybe not every single day but definitely every single week and you only really hear about the mistakes people make and i think it's a good like i I think if people realize how hard it is to get a triage job (laughs) uh, like it's they're they're ex-pen testers they're people that have you know had success in bug bounty hunters They're, they're hard jobs to get they're very good technical people yeah um I think they would ha- they would realize you know there's there's a better standard here, but YouTube's the same thing. They're going to make mistakes. The argument that kind of is frustrating is everyone keeps saying, oh, we should spin off and do our own YouTube, our own security thing. What I don't think they realize is there's no incentive for any of us to do that. Right. There's no audience carry there. You're just shifting from a company that you can actually resolve issues with to an individual who runs that site. Right. Like if an if a random hacker stands up a video site, I I'm at there you know, I, I'm subject to them, then I, I'm subject to right. YouTube, which I actually can fix things with. I'm, I'm not going to do that. And I don't think Stoke would do that or Ben or any of us, really. That's a good point. Um, it's a it's a mood argument, I think. It's it's one of those where it's like, it's a great idea, but the execution would never plan out. And so we have to learn to work with YouTube. Um, and it's not just our niche that struggles with this. Other niches struggle a, a great deal more because there's a definite bias there that's a negative one on how the world perceives things in different geographics. At least for us, it tends to be a technical issue, less so a um, an, an ethical one for them. Yeah, so. yep. and it, it, I think the key there is just as long as you've got path to resolution, you know. Um, yeah, yeah. But every, every single time I've seen the algorithm get it wrong, 
I, there's always that same argument that comes up in the Twitter thread. You know, it's like, okay, well, I'm going to make time. my own platform. Every single time, you know. Everyone... I'm, sure you, I'm sure you get the DMs, too. Of people yeah. are like, oh, I'm starting a platform. Would you churn to it and stuff? And that's kind of why I'm hitting on it. Because, yeah. like, I get that each week. Yep. Of different, you know. The, yeah. the only way I yeah. think that that even could possibly work is if, if we do get enough, like, really large creators to migrate and exclusively produce content on that and then and then maybe but even then it's like how, how do you compete with youtube and google like how how can, yeah how can you even do that twitch is a good example of this right like the people that have success on twitch don't get discovered on twitch they get discovered discovered on youtube and they churn an audience to twitch or they Some get already have a following on twitter and they turn to twitch right most of the way that people are building on twitch is through other platforms other verticals because that's their discoverability is better. YouTube, it's easier to get discovered for content. It's basically what Stoke taught me this actually really well. And the way he presented it was it's one big search engine. You optimize for the search engine and your other audiences come as a byproduct of that. And you make good content, people repeat to visit. Yep. But Twitch doesn't have any of that. How, like you, and I'm sure you've experienced it yourself. Like growing on Twitch is very, very hard if yeah. Twitch is all you do. Yeah. It's it's important to diversify into YouTube, and it would be the same challenge if we all turned to another platform. Discoverability is now a huge issue where we're, we've removed that barrier by being on YouTube. It's the same reason I wouldn't go to Vimeo or other things in the past. I just I just chose not to do it because it's you put hundreds of hours into something you want it to get seen. Yeah. So, and that's yeah. you know part of the thing for me is I wanted to help show people that it's possible to get into the industry. You know, I felt for a long time I would never be able to become a pin tester. Like, I'm not good enough. And Yeah, yeah. And so... I got, I got told... I got told uh, uh, two months before I spoke at a B-Sides event. And... Because I've been... I've been hacking since I was young. Like, I, I... And I was a developer that worked in finance, so I understood the Ars Top 10 pretty deeply. I had a recruiter tell me it would take me five years to break into the industry. And then I got my job at NCC, like six weeks later and I had multiple <laughs> offers at that round and I spoke at B sides like not long after that. It was just the percent. I think some people get put on the wrong path cause they get bad advice. Yep. Like a recruiter that doesn't really understand the industry because they don't really hire for it, even though they claim to, right. um, or, you know, someone who had a different path in my path, isn't the same as your path or the same as someone else's. Um, you know, and some people have it really easy. Some people have it really hard. Yeah. It's just, yeah. Yeah, and well, because of that exact reason, it's why I wanted to, you know, kind of help you do a lot of the type of work that Heath Adams, a cyber mentor, was doing on YouTube, where he's trying to like bridge the gap of people who are trying to break into the industry and teach you the low level stuff. And so, as I've been learning more and more, I'll make content on it. And and I think yeah. one of the powerful things about the YouTube platform is it's like we can reach people who may not even like actually have done any maybe they don't have any desire currently to be an ethical mm. hacker but but they're they're the youtube algorithm says hey well you watch kind of technical videos we think you'd like this and then now they can discover you know this whole world of, of pin testing and bug bounty hunting and, and all of that right and so it can almost like lure new people in that you wouldn't get on a platform that was just developed specifically for and only created by ethical hackers you know so it's mm. I like that. Yeah, that I think it's, of Well, I mean, that's it. Like, it's it's an exciting time to learn too, right? There's so much content now that, although, in saying that, I people say that a lot, and then I think about it, it's like it's probably almost more daunting to learn too because <laughs> there's so much content. Yeah. But, um, back back when I learned to hack, it was it's a ways back then. It's over 20 years. But I found it. I went on IRC. I got added to a tutorial site. It's probably safe to admit. Uh, there's a tutorial site called Arson Network where give a tutorial, receive a tutorial. So if you wrote something up, you'd receive something of equivalent value back, and that's how the, how it grew. Okay. And at certain points, you would gain access to more if you could access it yourself. So someone, I guess, how Hack the Box used to get their access. But it was easier in the sense that all the information was in one place, and I knew I could get all that information and just explore that. And I had one way of investing my time versus today you look at it – you you get people getting told do CTS, you get other people getting yeah. told to bug bounties, other people get told to OSCP. And it's like, well, it's hard for someone who's starting out to know where to prioritize. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but, I, uh, I've decided, you know, I've, I've decided, okay, after OSCP, what's next, what's next. And I've decided like four or five yeah. different paths. And then it's, <laughs> then a month goes by and it, it's completely a different path now because I get distracted <laughs> by the next new, new thing. 
<laughs> something new comes out, you yeah. know, expensive security just drops their new stuff. I think that's the that's the biggest challenge. I think for people starting out today is um, what is the priority? And the unfortunate answer there is that it's different for everyone. Yeah. Um, it's easier in the sense that if someone can tailor something for you, like if you get a good mentor, they can tailor things down and you can get a really clean pathway. But if you're an infrastructure background pivoting, it's different to develop a background pivoting versus a student who's jumping in. They're all different pathways and they're all different experiences. And a lot of the advice tends to push people into a single bucket and it just isn't how it works. It's, uh, yeah, the, the, the age old infosec reply of it's complicated. <laughs> it's, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. what what would you suggest? Like, you know, someone who's looking to break in, uh, do you have, like, top three suggestions of, like, these are what you absolutely should do no matter what your path looks like? I mean, networking's a principle among them. Um, the the best thing I did was go to Sec Talks for APAC specifically. Um, and if someone watching this is in Asia Pacific, um, if you go to my GitHub, there's an InfoSec Communities organization that I help manage with... Um, Hack hoodie and a heap of other people that we cut. We summarize all of the um, um, <laughs> what do you call it? the conferences and meetups and such in Australia for different regions. So finding those kind of resources and there is a good website that summarizes this for the US too, but I don't remember the name because I'm not in the US. <laughs> um, the I think the principal thing is surrounding yourself with like-minded people so you can seek the right advice. But also knowing when to trust your own your own your own journey, I guess. In terms of, if someone tells you you have to do CTS to jump in, but you're having a ton of fun going and pursuing, you know, something completely different, keep pursuing that because passion is the core driver. Yeah. Um, I hire a lot of security people, and I'll hire the person who shows more passion over the person who shows more technical aptitude, if I believe that passion is going to lead to someone growing more over time. It's it's just such a hard thing to follow a prescribed path, be really strict with yourself if you're not enjoying it. You should enjoy the journey. Be, you know, It's a little cliche advice, I guess, but I think it's important. Um, and I guess a well, third thing is probably document your journey. I think the thing I did really well that I use constantly um, is I started taking notes years ago and I've just built upon it over the years for myself. So I've got a private wiki now started as um, flat files, just a series of text documents. But um, every time I go to do something, if I want inspiration, I can jump in there and look at what I've done in the past, but I can also look at where I've come from. So, which is key because you can learn XSS today, spend the next three months learning it and feel like you haven't progressed a lot. But then you look at your old notes, and you're like, oh, no, I actually understand yeah. this now when I wrote that, you know, um, which is good for you know, just progress points, but also good for retaining knowledge because it sucks to have learned something and go a year later and be like, I wish I could remember that. And if you've got your own notes, you've written them in a style you can follow. So, yeah. yeah. And that, uh, I mean, I'd add on that. I think that that's fantastic advice and, uh, you know, doing, doing things that even if you want to take that extra step and you want that extra accountability, mm. like going out and making a blog yeah. or making a YouTube channel, making that stuff that you're doing public is going to force you <laughs> to, to make sure <laughs> yeah. it's more higher quality. Um, but it's also super inspiring. Like if I never mm. created a blog, I would have never started doing YouTube. And if I didn't start doing YouTube, I want to be able to have conversations like this. And, and this is like my favorite thing now, you know? And so, it's YouTube. I think if only people could see how much goes into it, right? Oh, oh, yeah. You know, I I ended up doing this. I, I don't know if you've seen it. It was uh, I just took an easy machine on Hack the Box, um, and mm -hmm. I I turned it into like this game. It was like this adventure game. So I would show like you know a ninety second clip of of starting the machine. We'd start with a TCP and map scan, and then you get to yep. the end of it, and it's like okay. So these ports are open. What do you do next? Do you want to enumerate RDP? Do you want to enumerate SMB? Or do you want to start a UDP scan? And the end, and the the person watching the video has to click the end screen element that leads oh, to the cool. next video. Yeah, yeah. So that's a really good idea. It's a really basic concept yeah. that had never been done before, and so I did it, and it was really well received. Um, and, it, and I just did Legacy on Hack the Box, which is a super basic yep, yep. machine. Um, but that video. Even though it only takes someone 10 minutes to go through the entire thing, took me, I mean, man, <laughs> if, if I had to put it <laughs> into, it, it was at least like yeah, 20, yeah. 30 hours worth of editing and, and recording and chopping it up. So it was, yeah, a lot yeah. goes into YouTube and I don't even put my production quality anywhere near the same caliber as what you're doing on your channel with all the effects and everything. So, 
Yeah, it's um, I mean, uh, yeah, just assets and interstitials too, right? Like you do a pop out and <laughs> like some of that stuff. I've got so much time and planning and execution going into. Uh, you reap the benefit over every video, but yeah, it takes a long time. So yeah, it's good though. Yeah, for sure. Well, I mean, what what's next for you? Do you? I mean, obviously, don't share trade secrets or anything like that. <laughs> but but what's next I've for? Got, well, I'm gonna do. I'm gonna start releasing some of my tools in video, like do a paired video and release some of them because there's some tools I never released. So before this role, I was hunting a lot and I had no incentive to release a lot of that. It, um, you, yeah, like I actively didn't want to, right? Because there was benefit to be gained in having it and. Now I can't really hunt as much because I'm managing a triage team. Uh, I'm looking at releasing some of that, as well as um, there's some new ideas I'm pursuing. So I've got a good concept started to work up for something that helps you prioritize assets, like which should you look at in what order for large scopes. So I'm going to probably stream the creation process of that once I've got it a little bit more bettered down. Um, just once I've got it bettered down to a point that I can flick it public, I'll then build it on stream because what I want is that um, people can contribute in between streams and then I can show people the process of managing a repository as well. Awesome. So I think that'll be pretty valuable. Um, so that I'll flick some point in the next couple of weeks. And then um, I'm going to start doing my video edits live because I'm spending the time anyway. Um, and I keep getting asked questions about it. I want something to flick people to. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I feel bad when it's like, I don't, you know, I, I don't know really good resources for learning it because I kind of did it the, the bad way. I brute force my way to it um and i think that there's some benefit in just showing people it's not as hard as people think it's time intensive for sure because you second guess you re-record you like the process of creating the content is time intensive but i think the process of editing is not as difficult as people think it is um and i'd like to show that so that'll be the next steps i think um plus i want a reason to write tools again <laughs> you know <laughs> i want something that drives me to do it so that should be fun. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, you know, you had mentioned that that passion is super important, something you look for as a hiring manager. So I, I can only imagine with everything you've got that you're trying to juggle, you know, like I don't imagine you have much free time. <laughs> so it's just like oh, the, it's... the passion that has to keep driving you. Yeah, I, I just prioritize really well. I get that a lot. It, um, Like I, I have a reasonable capacity for work. Like I do five to five each day at, typically. Um, and then I'll, it's always a hard stop at five. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what it is. It's a hard stop. Um, and then, you know, I'll spend time with my family, spend time with my kids and do all of that, um, which is fulfilling. And I recharge off that. Yeah. And then, um, sometimes I'll come back to it at night and I'll do like the video is usually done at night. It's, um, I'll, I'll script it and I'll tease it. Like I've got, I think 16 or 17 that are in the works where I've just been building out the script and teasing the idea and then I'll record it in one big hit and then do the edit another time. Um, or I might, you know, sometimes I'll record two or three and then edit two or three, um, like in different ways. So I'm just very structured with it, which I think keeps me on task for it. Because if I don't do that, I'm, I jump in too many directions <laughs> and nothing gets done. Right. Um, but yeah. Um, it's working, so you know well, that's, that's good. good. That's good. So, what What do you yeah. think is the purpose behind why you why you're doing the YouTube? Like, is that you know? Do you have like an end goal in mind? Is it just like a fun thing now? There's, yeah. So there's some in there. There's a few structured learning paths coming out. So there's recon at scale, and I'm trying to make more of a beginner's path as well. So working in triage, you see the gap between a good hunter and a bad hunter is highly evident um and it, it's i want more that people can refer to for some of this some of this just doesn't get taught very well like um xss is a great example of a bug class that's really poorly taught it's always taught how to pop xss and it just kind of stops you look at any xss challenge slide it just stops um and i really want to do content around that um, it's a, I've picked on this one a lot. I've, I've in many a conference talk, I've had an XSS alert one slide and, and ranted a bit about it. Um, <laughs> it, it, but it's also, you know, impact and business impact is key, but as a hacking industry, the way the education is positioned and 
it's it's become all about like offsec are probably the main culprit of this it's become all about the shell all yeah. about the technical bug and it's removed itself from the business impact and i know their excuse is oh you write the report and all of that but you're not really measured by the stick of how well you explain the business impact on that so that's kind of a bad response um and i think i want content because it I want content that talks more around impact and understanding than uh, OWASP top 10 understand just that. And so uh, it just doesn't, in my eyes, exist enough. And I know there's other creators doing it, but the more of that, the better, right? Um, as well as stuff that I wanted when I was starting out. So uh, one series I started working on is the OWASP top 10. So what the building a lab where I can show the bug show why the bug exists, how to patch the bug, and then common bypasses two different patches so that a dev can watch that and fully understand SQL injection and why you parameterize and things like that, not just get told yep. you should parameterize. Because, you know, the pen test industry is pretty guilty of that, of just, <laughs> oh, you should do this, right. not without a complete understanding. And so then you see, as a pen tester, you'll see customers do funny things because we, we're guilty of this such as um, just patching the vulnerable request, but not patching, you know, the core or not fixing the core issue. They're just like, oh, well, if they can do this, we'll just filter that string out on the WAF and we're good, right? And then they get retests and they, they learn the hard way. Um, and so I want something there that devs can learn from and not just, not just the focus on uh, bugs and red team, I guess. It's... Uh, I don't know. Build you build build what you want, right? Like yeah. you build the things that you want to exist out there. It's the same reason to write tools. You you want a specific tool, and that's that's my principal motivation is building the things I wanted a couple of years ago to be out there. So that's awesome. So yeah. it's just it's just help. You know, your mission is basically just helping the community fill the gaps that that you see, and I think yeah. that that's that's really awesome. And you've got a unique perspective with your experience and then the, the position mm. you're in with bug crowd. And so you, you really do get yeah. to kind of see more than I think most of us do. Um, so thank you for well, taking think, the time to, to fill that role. Yeah. But that's unfortunate too, in that we I think it's worth putting that content out because I think people need to understand more about it. Yeah. I think it's like triage is a black box to a lot of people. Um, so I'm trying to seek approval at the moment to talk about some of my bug chains go through, get the triage notes at the time and talk about it end to end. So this is what I did as a researcher. The, the bugs are a couple of years old now, so I still got to chase approvals, but it's easier. Uh, so this is how I landed on the chain. This was my discovery. This is where I failed. This is where I succeeded. And then talk about this is what I did wrong that would have helped triage understand better or help triage create a better impact or, you know, things like that. Helping people to, I guess, demystify that right. part of the industry. So... It'd be interesting. It's uh, see if I can manage to do it or not. <laughs> it's a <laughs> it's a hard thing to cover, and a anything that touches triage, you you get detractors that are like, oh, this and that and the other thing. Um, even though I think the majority see impact in it, it's the, it, every time someone's like negative about that stuff, it stings a bit, and you're kind of like, oh, should I bother? So, yeah. Uh, yeah it'll come together yeah well i think um, i think you're the right guy for the job man so i i have mm. i have good faith in you <laughs> mm. well do you, yeah thank you. <laughs> do you do you have any do you have any plugs any links or anything that you want to kind of advertise or oh, i mean i think if, if people haven't found them yet like you know stokes content inside a phd uh hack luke I, i've been told is coming back to content so that'll be good when it comes back and yeah. uh farah farah Hauer. um I think all of that, like all of our different types of approaches to content, if you watch it, you get a pretty well-rounded perspective on different things. Like I, I said it in the FF video, I was making my FF video for weeks and Insider released right before it. I was devastated for a while until I watched it. I, I was like, oh, I can't release this now. I spent so long. And then I watched it. I realized it was a totally different angle and the two complemented each other really, really well. Um, and I think that, you know, if you really wanted to understand FUF, you should watch both videos or FUF, FUF. Everyone corrects me on this one all the time. So <laughs> who knows? Um, but the, the point being that, um, her way of educating and my way of educating is so different that watching both pieces of content makes you the most well-rounded in a subject, yeah. um, that I think people should watch widely. Um, and then, you know, this, the stuff that Stoke does to, bring to the forefront change in the industry that's exhausting to keep up with and hard to keep up with and if you're watching that you're just you're you're becoming aware of changes i guess that are happening that you may not otherwise 
that I think is really important. Um, I like I get I, I watch GitHub religiously, and I still find tools in his videos where I was like, "How did I miss that?" <laughs> um, just because he's you know he's so well so widely networked on it. Yeah. Um, and then same as I'm trying to give triage insights. I mean that inspiration I drew from Farah doing it. So she she started that trend and was doing that. Um, and that's where I was like, oh, I should do that on scope and a couple other things. But um, I think because she's in a triage role and she's working that directly, she's got a very unique perspective on it that is good for people to understand and connect with. Um, so, yeah, so I think other creators, is, there's a bunch of others I haven't mentioned. Um, XSS Rat, um, he, <laughs> I feel bad because I know I could just keep listening and I'm going to forget <laughs> people, but that's not intentional. It's just so many good creators now. Uh, Vicky. She's, and she's doing really good blog paired content, which is something people liked about the FFUF video, but she does it constantly. Um, I forget the channel name there. But, but yeah, like, I, I mean, that's how I'm trying to grow as a creator too, is let's just watch a bunch of people's content yeah, and see, you know, what are people doing? Where is their opportunity to expand in a different angle on what someone's done, which I like, I hope people do to my content too. If I cover something, there's always a different angle that can be taken on it. Yeah. Um, which helps us grow as a community ultimately. So definitely, yeah. definitely. I mean, so. that, that was, that was one of the biggest questions I used to ask, you know, but before I got started with anything is I would go on Reddit and I would post like, would anybody care if I did a hack the box right up? Like everybody else has already done this. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Like it's been done a thousand times. So why would you get, you know, do you really want to see mine? And yeah. the responses were crazy. Everyone was like, yeah, dude, do it, do it, do it. And it's cause everybody learns differently. And so you can, you can consume the same exact content from different instructors or creators or whatever you want to call them. Totally. And, and people, pe you know, it'll resonate with one person where it may resonate with a, a person differently, you know, a different it's, person. I mean, it's, I get that too. It's the same reason I haven't kicked off streaming yet. Cause I wanted to f like Ben rocks it and I yeah. could never do what he does. And so I wanted to make sure I had something unique, which went, which then I was like, okay, well doing tools and doing video editing is something I can, I'm already spending time. I can kick a stream around it and it's, it's good for people to see the insight because writing tools is, is I think people will be interested to see how much time I spend in Google because I jump around <laughs> languages and I don't know libraries very well. It, I, you watch Tom Nom Nom Code and the guys of Genius or Donut and they're just like, yeah, and they know their libraries so well. I am so opposite to that. I'm like, <laughs> how? I, yeah, mine is notes and Google and I think it's good to expose that kind of thing. Same with video editing. Like there's so many things that you change and you you learn as you go. It's good for people to see that process. Um so be cool. And I think it, but yeah, I mean, I, I stalled it for ages. I wanted to do streaming early on, but I was like, well, I just, there needs to be a value prop. There needs to be something to add. Um, I just didn't know what it was for a while. So, well, I, I think yeah. even if it's just, you know, the same, the same content delivered differently, I think that that's valuable, you know, to some people, I think they'll mm. see that as valuable, even if they've seen it from someone else before. So, mm. but yeah, man. Yeah. I, I want to be mindful of your time. I know that you're probably on a lunch break, and I, I really do appreciate you taking time sure. to come out and <laughs> chat with me. Um, I don't really have any other questions. So is there anything in particular you would like to chat about? No, I think that's good. It's, cool. um, yeah, I guess it's, uh, you know, I'm a pretty open book. If people have questions, they can tag me on Twitter. It's, uh, <laughs> I, I can be slow to respond there just because of you know, being in, a bug cred role, I get a bit of it, but sure. always happy to try and answer when I get to it. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, what's uh, what's the best way for people to reach you? Uh, Twitter would be the best way in case they want to yeah. reach out for anything. Cool. Twitter tends to be. I'm in a bunch of discords and slacks around. I tend to sit around, but it's usually better to tag me in those. I usually can't monitor everything, but I do try and idle around a heap of places and chat where I can. So. Awesome. Well, yep. We'll definitely yeah. have links to your Twitter, your Twitch, your YouTube. All that will be in the description yeah. of this video. Um, and yeah, I, I, this was, this was awesome. It was great to actually get to meet you face to face and ask you some questions. <laughs> yeah. So thank you so much. Awesome. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. Have a good one.